going to do to open up the day is have uh, one of these um, so-called fireside chats. Mm -hmm. So instead of formal introductions and speeches, we're going to kick off with a conversation. And you'll get to hear um, two different perspectives that both align and that differ. We want a little bit of back and forth. So uh, we'll see if we can rustle up some areas where there's creative tension and use that to put out some themes that we think will actually be woven through the rest of the day. So that's our plan right now. I could not do justice to a proper introduction of either of um, you. So I've actually decided to ask <laughs> you to pull out a few elements of your own experience and interests that brings you to this point in time. So talk a little bit about any aspect of the work you've done or you're doing that motivating you sitting here right now. Robert, tell us a little bit about some of the things you've, that, that's brought you here today. Well, thank you very much. And um, good morning, everybody. And, and thank you for being here. Um, so Fiona and I at the reception last evening were talking about a, a touch of imposter syndrome. I definitely have imposter syndrome being here this morning in the sense that <laughs> I don't pretend to be uh, an expert on, on global health or healthcare systems. I do see myself as an enthusiast and as, as a supporter, but let me tell you why, what's behind my enthusiasm. So, uh, as a, a young doctor, I um, had the opportunity to work in three very different kinds of healthcare system. So I spent a short time uh, in northern Nigeria, and then I spent a short time in Nepal, both pretty impoverished areas. And there, it was painful to work in the healthcare system because, nakedly, the treatment that was on offer was related to someone's wealth. And we had the awful experience of having to essentially consign some young patients to palliative treatment because they couldn't afford to go from Nepal to Delhi, for example, uh, where the surgical intervention was on offer. So that was northern Nigeria and Nepal, gross inequality and um, a lot of suffering as a consequence. Then I worked, in contrast, in the US uh, for a while. And there, it's again, there's inequality. And there's a sense, with sometimes watching a medical admitting team, there's a sort of wallet biopsy as the patient <laughs> comes in, working out what kind of insurance they have and what cover they've got. Uh, indeed, I remember when I uh, signed on myself for uh, health insurance cover, uh, I was asked, did I want mental health cover? And, uh, and I'd never thought about that, and I knew I was going into a very stressful environment with a very intense lab boss. Uh, I chose to forego that, unfortunately. <laughs> didn't need it. Um, and then thirdly, in the National Health Service. Now, the luxury of working in the NHS, in one sense, is that you just when I was training, you just don't think about money. You don't think about what anything costs. In fact, you don't even know what it costs. But on the other hand, that makes you very lazy. And so there's no concept, as I was training, there was no concept of what is now alive and well, which is value-based healthcare. So all of those three healthcare systems are running into exactly the same problem, and that is that they are bordering on unsustainable and unaffordable, and it's a global challenge as to how we create sustainable healthcare systems. So that's my healthcare background and what drives me to recognize the importance of what we're discussing today. Briefly on innovation, um, so I spent the other half of my life as a researcher um, trying to manipulate the immune system to make transplants work better and last longer. And again, in my research experience in the research world I grew up in, nobody really thought very much about the affordability of any innovation that was coming out of their research. I certainly didn't. As it happens, what I do, I think, has quite a good economic case, because if it's possible to persuade the immune system to be selectively blind to a transplant without drugs, then the short-term intervention may cost a lot of money, but you're saving uh, a big burden of drugs uh, that, that cost a lot of money year after year for those transplant patients. So that's all right, but we never thought about that. And so I think now the concept of sustainable innovation uh, is, again, very alive and well and terribly important. And whenever we get engaged in a novel intervention, diagnostic, therapeutic, or system change, we need to have an eye and an ear to affordability. So that's excellent. my background. Thanks. Fiona, tell us a bit about what brought you here today. Of course. Pull out anything in your anything background that you and like. experience. Okay. 
So I'm just going to say a little bit um, about imposter syndrome, just to pick up on Robert, what Robert had to say, although I'm sure there must be a professional medical definition of what that really means, uh, which is that you're expecting a faculty member from MIT. Uh, MIT is a global institution, um, but an American one, and so I'm sorry that I don't come with a completely American accent, so I apologize for those of you who are expecting Americans, likewise Georgina, um, as our executive director of Legatum, also doesn't quite fulfill that promise. So um, I moved over to the United States and to MIT almost 20 years ago now. I have a scientific and engineering background, um, but basically decided that the best place for me where I thought I could really make a difference in the world was to really try to understand how to create the conditions, the environment, the policies that you need to allow people to be really effective in the laboratories and to make sure that when we spend money on research and the academic setting in particular, that those ideas can get out uh, and, and take that journey that we think about as taking the journey from idea to impact. So our definition of innovation is not just that we would create tremendous publications, that people would come up with extraordinary new ideas and scientific breakthroughs, but that those breakthroughs would actually transform themselves all the way from the lab bench out into the world. Uh, I wasn't particularly good at the lab bench. I'm extremely clumsy, and nobody would want me in their lab for terribly long, and I'm also quite impatient. Um, and so I found myself really wanting to try and understand those conditions uh, for innovation. So that could be things like intellectual property policy, uh, diversity and inclusion issues, how we really have diverse teams, uh, how we design the right kind of infrastructure, uh, at, at a variety of levels, how we ex um, establish accelerators. And recognizing that innovation is a system, I think just to sort of unpack the word system a little bit, uh, system dynamics and system thinking has very much been something that's been on the mind of my colleagues at MIT, and Anjali is one of those people who's really pushed our thinking where you recognize that there are many, many points of intervention. Uh, I think a key ways of changing those systems has to do with entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs, and it has to do with the human agents who can really direct change. And so a lot of my academic career has been having a responsibility to educate and support our entrepreneurs throughout our community, first with students in the classroom, uh, but also faculty <coughs> colleagues, other research scientists, and those and alum when they leave uh, the university. I was very struck when I did the um, alumni survey with one of my colleagues, where we looked at the entrepreneurial impact that our MIT alum had around the world. And we could replicate this survey with King's students, with Stanford students, and I think we'd find some similar results. That those individuals have gone on to create businesses, uh, create companies that have not only created wealth, they've actually had global impact, they've actually solved big important problems, and they've created jobs. And that's something that as an, an academic institution we're extraordinarily proud of, and we're as proud of that as we are with our sort of mountain of academic publications and with our quite large hill of, of patents and the more traditional measures and metrics. And so I've spent a lot of time and energy supporting our students, and, and as has Anjali and many of my colleagues, Georgina and others, about five years ago, I became faculty director of the Legatum Center for Entrepreneurship and Development. And so my job then shifted to really supporting students who were entrepreneurs wanting <coughs> to drive change in the developing world. And to really focus on their energies, their taking ideas to impact in the service of big global challenges. Now, I quickly thought that that was going to be quite a hard job because what I would call the vanilla entrepreneurship, which is how to be on an entrepreneur in the United States or the United Kingdom, that's a difficult job. But what happens when we transplant that attempt to really take ideas to impact into uh, countries and places where institutions can be weak, uh, where there's very, very limited infrastructure, uh, where there's all sorts of challenges around corruption, there's many, many additional challenges that people need to really think about. And so that's been uh, the subject of my attention for the last several years, um, is really how to support that community. I've been incredibly struck by the passion and enthusiasm of our students, and that's what makes it tremendous to get up in the morning and do all these things, and to watch how they've actually gone and had a really world-changing impact. And I think <coughs> that what brings me here today is a recognition that we can support them in general, but it's often when we support them in a challenge-by-challenge -challenge basis that we can be the most effective. I think the healthcare system is perhaps one of the most important for all the reasons that Robert just described. And so when we can support those students who are trying to affect change uh, in the healthcare system and when we can support our faculty and colleagues, that's really when we can make a difference. 
And so I wanted to not only continue the work of supporting our students, but actually have a more global conversation about what it takes <coughs> and how we can build the systems and infrastructure to make them even more effective and to make sure that the academic research and the on-the-ground work really actually gets out there to make a difference. And so that is what brought me to having this conversation over a number of uh, dinners and, and other conversations um, with Robert and to recognise that our two institutions have a tremendous amount in common, but they have huge complementarities and that King's sort of deep and long-term expertise on the ground um, and in thought leadership around health and healthcare and medicine, coupled with MIT's long-standing uh, support and expertise in entrepreneurship and systems thinking um, and engineering, those are some things that we can bring together. It's not that each institution doesn't have some of the other bits, but there's a tremendous complementarity, and I think a sort of can-do attitude that's incredibly important that we share. So, cool. thank you. Excellent. So Fiona mentioned, she mentioned systems and clearly has a big picture view um, as a dean at MIT and also someone who um, talks to governments and researchers around the world. Robert, I want to tap into your big picture view. Where do you think the biggest investment of effort and innovation needs to play out when we talk about improving health systems? What is it about... Health system strengthening has been in the lexicon of healthcare leaders for several decades now, and um, it's invoked all the time. From your, you've got such deep expertise here. How do you see the biggest? Where do you see the biggest needs? Hmm. Uh, well, that's a huge topic and a huge question. Um, but one or two uh, reflections. So uh, let's start at home here. Um, so we have something called the National Health Service, which uh, is called the, the, the British religion. Um, <laughs> we're all very fond of it. Uh, it has many problems. But it isn't really a National Health Service. It's a, it's a National Disease Service. So it is set up to deal with people who present uh, with an illness. And so if I start stepping right back, I mean, if you say where is the biggest impact to be had uh, in terms of population and global health. It has to start with better prevention and health promotion. And that is something that has been underinvested in in this country for sure, and I think in, in most countries around the world. So if you're designing a system, then I think we need much greater emphasis on health promotion and prevention. And if you think about value-based healthcare, the most compelling value proposition of the lot mm -hmm. uh, is to get better uh, at promoting health uh, and reducing the disease burden. And then um, I've grown up in the very much a hospital setting as a sort of high-tech uh, research clinical academic. Uh, that's the world I know, it's the world I've lived in and the world I've occupied and that, that is what has consumed most of my energy. However, if you really, again, you want to design a health system from scratch, that's uh, not the icing on the cake exactly, but the, but the community-based healthcare system has to be the, mm -hmm. uh, the bedrock, I would say, of uh, a, a successful, impactful healthcare system. And then you layer on top of that, uh, when necessary, um, then you need the specialist services and the hospital provision. So I think when we talk about systems, we do need to get the whole continuum from prevention, health promotion, community-based health care, uh, working through to secondary and tertiary care. Um, and just dealing with one bit is never going to solve the problem. And watching what happens in some low and middle income settings where people just parachute in, do some bit, and then retreat, uh, it may have a short-term benefit, but it is not going to change the population health in, in that setting in a long-term sustainable way. So mm -hmm. what I've really learnt a lot from is watching my colleagues, whom I have a great respect for, some of whom are in the room, who built up uh, these country partnerships with mm -hmm. starting off with Somaliland, then Sierra Leone, now Congo and Zambia. Um, and what I've learnt from watching them and what they have done is that the value of a sustained long-term relationship with a system, earning the right to, uh, to then introduce innovations, has been key to the success of the impact uh, that we've had. Cool. So I'm going to put a question to you, but 
since I'm sitting in the middle, I'll interject. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about your last answer. It's really interesting. Clearly, we need p interventions and approaches that account for the whole system. One of the things I've been experimenting with at MIT is how we use short-term engagements as vehicles to further the dialogue, the learning, and the collaboration. So that, yes, we may not have a countrywide collaboration somewhere, but I, we've actually been doing research on doing four month long engagements with say primary care clinics uh, in the public sector in both Zambia, India and uh, South Africa and finding that if they're well designed, you actually can kickstart an improvement effort, especially we were teaching process improvement and wait time reduction and visit design. Mm. We went back one, two and three years later and could actually see that the tools were taken up and spread and built upon. So there's some role, I think, also for shorter engagements if they're really wisely designed. Mm. And I think, for me as an instructor, part of what I totally see is the value of education. <coughs> and I'm inviting people into professional approaches and tools that can help them run their own clinics better. Um, so I think there's a really interesting dialogue to have about these different vehicles for actually engaging in the, the setting. Um, but Fiona, I'm going to turn it to you now and ask. We, I, we knew Robert would talk about the, we knew you'd talk about we the NHS talk, yes. because yes. it's <laughs> an amazing, fascinating system that we're always interested to learn more about. Um, and we know that prevention is so important in healthcare. It's clearly the bang for buck investment. Yet it's pretty hard to get a profitable business model out of prevention. Mm -hmm. So what's the role mm -hmm. for business? What's business. the role for entrepreneurs? Yeah. What's the role for the whole kind of profit angle here. Right. So one of the things that we do is we work a lot with regions around the world who want to really create these very vibrant innovation ecosystems. So places where um, there can be a real flourishing, not only of innovation, but also of entrepreneurship, a real flourishing of some of the high growth companies, and not necessarily because they create a lot of jobs, although they often do, or they often create wealth, but really because when those companies scale, their solutions scale with them, and they can often reach very, very large numbers of individuals with their solutions. And so we tend to break this down into these two pieces. One is innovation capacity. So that's the capacity to sort of generate and really scale and develop new to the world ideas, but also entrepreneurial capacity. So that is to really be able to build those startup enterprises that can actually drive that scaling activity and make sure that whatever solution it is, whether it be um, a medicine, whether it be a medical device, whether it be a prevention oriented tool, that those things can actually scale. We've worked with a lot of regions worldwide. They've often chosen different foci, so it hasn't necessarily been health. Uh, and those regions can include everywhere from sort of Ghana and Lagos to Seoul and Singapore. Um, many of these places are starting to think about how to build that innovation capacity, which often starts with academic research and on the ground understanding. But the entrepreneurial capacity is all, all about how to educate and build the skills and knowledge for those human agents who are actually going to be entrepreneurs. And I think entrepreneurs are sometimes overlooked as we think about the global health picture. I think they're incredibly important human agents in the system. Entrepreneurs in many ways at their best are very, very problem focused. We tell them all the time to go and talk to the customer, understand the needs, understand the user. I think if we frame that <laughs> a slightly different way, it's understand the problem. So they are sort of like problem seekers. And in a lot of the work that we've done in educating those kinds of people at MIT, especially in the medical arena, we've often sent these entrepreneurs into our local hospitals, into Mass General or the Brigham, because we've said a hospital is a problem-rich environment. And so if you're going to go around that environment as a sort of problem-seeking uh, individual, there's plenty for you to look at. What happens when we translate those pe transfer those people to other locations to look at an entire health system, or we give those people in those health systems the capacity to think about their problems, then you're actually creating a set of really problem-focused human agents. And we're going to hear, I think, from quite a lot of them uh, today, because it's really they who are able to understand those very specific points of intervention and leverage. I think, secondly, we know that this journey needs many organizations. So we're to have the kind of interventions that Robert has talked about. There are many stakeholders who have to come together. And I think we can take for granted that the universities are important, that large organizations, NGOs, are important. 
uh, in this country uh, and in many countries, large corporations are very important in developing uh, many of the solutions that come to market. Um, but startups have a very particular characteristic. Again, they have the right kinds of incentives to cause people to work really hard and be very focused. And they can actually attract completely new forms of capital. And I think that's very important. Those forms of capital can be risk capital, it can be venture capital, it can also be various forms of philanthropic capital that are highly, highly targeted. And so I think that if we think about that organisational form as another kind of entity that has to be in this complicated system puzzle, there are going to be problems um, for which the startup is actually a very important vehicle as part of the transformation of the health system. Do those vehicles make a profit? Quite often they do. Is that something that we should be in this health systems context worried about? Well, one of the things that having a profit motive does is it causes you to identify problems and to come up with reasonable solutions that people can afford. So if I'm trying to think about solving these problems in countries where people's ability to pay is low, I'm going to have to be incredibly creative in understanding solution space. And when we think, come, we'll hear, I think, from some of our uh, alums who are working on companies that range from uh, clinics for diabetes to um, finding lower cost medical devices uh, and medical equipment um, to the use of AI and, and diagnosis. There are lots and lots of opportunities, I think, that don't have to be synonymous with, with um, you know, excessive profits, but where the profit motive actually allows you to reinvest and scale solutions. Um, so it's not that I think that the other stakeholders aren't key. In our MIT model, we think about the government, large corporations, the university, but we also think about entrepreneurs and risk capital. I think they need to have a place at the table because they can be very focused agents of change in complex systems. And so that's why we pay a lot of attention to them um, and think that they matter. So there's quite an image. I'm left with this picture of almost like heat-seeking missiles, problem-seeking <laughs> individuals. <laughs> I am sure, Robert, your experience and your faculties and your institutional base here and globally might offer some really useful guidance, warnings even, <laughs> to such <laughs> problem-seeking agents. What would you want to put on the table for us to think about now? If we're encouraging people to be entrepreneurs, give us your I don't know, stern guidance. <laughs> <laughs> That's very scary. I, yeah, well, because exactly. I, know he has, I know he sees the whole system, so I really want to so, understand what we should be also worried about. Well, no, I, 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 you wanted us to disagree, and I'm yes, really struggling. It's um, because, <laughs> because I, my job. <laughs> because because I, think, I think we are, unfortunately, in violent agreement. Um, because it is, it, it is bringing a whole set of skills to bear on this challenge that is absolutely key to our success. This is, these are really, really tough issues to crack. I mean, it's, you know, it's tough in the UK and it's tough in the US and it's tough in Sierra Leone. So we need, uh, we need a, a suite of skills um, and, and Fiona uh, quite understandably is emphasising the value, value of what Americans call entrepreneurs. Um, and, <laughs> and that's, of course, that's absolutely right. Um, at the same time, you need, uh, you need to think about the workforce. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think we think creatively enough about the workforce that we need for uh, the health care that we'll be delivering in 2030. In this country, we're not thinking innovatively enough. And so we need to think innovatively about that in some of these uh, more resource-poor settings, even more uh, creatively, I think. Um, we're, we're not adapting to, I mean, the, ch the changing demographics and disease burden. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's true worldwide. Um, I was rather shocked to discover, actually, that the, the, the average life expectancy on this planet Earth, I don't know if people would, I'm not going to ask you, but anyhow, it is 75. Mm -hmm. So the average life expectancy in the whole of the planet Earth is 75 uh, years, which is, I have to say, longer than I would have guessed. Yeah. And so that comes with all the diseases of ageing, it comes with multimorbidity, it comes with chronic disease, a whole series of things that are, the healthcare system in this country is not well designed to address uh, multimorbidity. So, so I think that uh, it's the, the, the buzzword, if I had one, it would be sustainable innovation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's thinking in an entrepreneurial, creative way about how we can do things differently because just doing things the same is not going to fix it but with an eye to sustainability and affordability and applicability in the setting that you're working in. So mm -hmm. 
I, I don't, of course, I respect what you say about short-term interventions can have a long-term impact. Of course they can. Um, but I, I think what I was kind of hinting at being slightly critical of is just someone parachuting in to do some clever little thing and satisfying themselves, publishing a paper and retreating yes. and leaving nothing very much behind doesn't have a long-term gain. So, so I think it's, 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 it's thinking creatively, entrepreneurship absolutely vital, um, nothing wrong with a profit-based uh, drive in some settings, uh, but thinking about tailoring your innovation to the setting and yeah. making sure that it's sustainable. So that, that idea of sustainability of the intervention or the business is so crucial. Maybe that's the most kind of important theme that we'll keep touching on. Do you have any final thoughts on how we can frame the thinking around sustainable innovation mm -hmm. for the room here today? Oh, I'm disappointed. I was going to offer my own stern warning. Oh, I'd love a stern <laughs> warning. <laughs> yeah. I just like the idea of that. So, <laughs> so I think my not very stern warning, but the thing I want to highlight, I think, is actually the sustainability piece. Um, and this, I think, is something that is important for our entrepreneurial community, and that is the one here, the one in any of the countries we're talking about uh, in the United States, but also for the medical and, and research community. So that I think thinking about innovations and solutions that are actually appropriate to the context is extraordinarily important. And as much as we don't want to parachute in, kind of think about a point solution, sort of drop it down or, you know, give people a whole bunch of equipment and then leave again, I would also say that as we think about the research projects, trying to think about what it would take for that project to go from being an extraordinarily interesting and important insight into the medical uh, environment in a particular place or a new approach to disease or prevention, to actually think about what the plan is for that to then be scaled to have impact across an entire uh, village, a set of villages, a country, is extremely important. And I think that just to sort of perhaps end with a question about education, because we are in educational institutions. I've had the opportunity to think very carefully about how we would educate entrepreneurs to really understand medicine and health, and to recognize that there's an enormous amount that they need to learn to become multilingual, to become cosmopolitans, so that they can live in their own entrepreneurial world and all the key stakeholders, but also have serious and meaningful and respectful conversations with the medical world. I think it's also true that there's an enormous room for some ed education and some of the sharing of language and skills around entrepreneurship in medical education to actually have um, medical and research experts really understand the opportunities that are afforded when we think about entrepreneurial methods and opportunities so that their ideas actually then can live on for much, much longer. And so I think it's this crosstalk that we're having as individuals, we're having as a community, we probably need to bring into our classrooms. And I don't think that's easy because the curriculum is already very full and busy mm -hmm. um, and there are not many people who can sort of do that crosstalk. But I think that's a tremendous opportunity that we probably Excellent. all have. So that gives us something else to think about. How do we harness the, the educational institutions that we're in? What are the first steps we could try? Mm -hmm. Are there new collaborations, experiments we can try when we think about educating and contextualizing our students' own learning? And to that end, I'll wrap up, but I'll mention that uh, Julie Devonshire, is Julie here mm. yet? Um, and I have a piece that came out this morning in Times um, Higher Education talking a bit about this very theme. It's so very it's good. good yeah. It's good Read timing. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank Leadership you both so much. Thank you. Thank you.